Good morning, everyone. I am Ro Ding, chairman of BACI, Burmese American Community Institute. And also, I'm a recipient of the Burmese Refugee Scholarship Program 2004 intake. And thanks to IU Bloomington and the program, BRSP program. And also, uh, I would like to welcome from my campus. I am the one of the staffs working in uh, IUPUI as the research technician in the dental school. Uh, welcome, everybody. I am now very honored to introduce our next keynote speaker for today, His Excellency Wu Chao Tin, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Myanmar to the United Nations. His Excellency Wu Chao Tin has served in this capacity since September 2012 when he presented his credential to UN Secretary of General Ban Ki-moon. Prior to his appointment, Wu Jotin served as Myanmar's ambassador to Canada and the Director General of Political Department at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Yangon. Having been Deputy Director General from 2007 to 2008 and Director of the South and West Asia Division from 2005 to 2006, before that, he was charged the affair at Myanmar's embassy in Ottawa from February to October 2005. Uchotin served as counselor at the permanent mission in New York from 2003 to 2005, and as deputy chief of mission counselor in Jakarta Indonesia from 2001 to 2003. He was deputy director of the international organizations and economic development between 1999 and 2001, having served as assistant director prior to that. From 1994 to 1997, he was first secretary, second secretary at Myanmar's permanent mission in Geneva. He also headed branches, branch one of the international organizations and economic development and served as second secretary at the embassy in Bangkok, Thailand from 1987 to 1991. Before his appointment as deputy assistant director to international organizations and economic department from 1986 to 1987, Wu Jotin was third secretary at the New York Permanent Mission from 1984 to 1986, as well as deputy assistant director of international organization division from 1983 to 1984, and chancellor in Canberra, Australia, from 1982 to 1983. Needless, needless to say, he has led a very impressive diplomatic career. Wu Jotin holds a Master of Science in Mathematics from Yangon University and a postgraduate diploma in Environmental Management from Dresden University of Technology in Germany. We are incredibly honored to have him joining us today at the U.S. Myanmar Engagement Conference in Indianapolis. I now invite His Excellency Wu Cho Tin to deliver keynote, speaker, keynote speech. Thank you. Let us welcome Wu Cho. Uh, distinguished speakers, distinguished guests, our members of uh, Myanmar American community here in, in Indianapolis, ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, always uh, very difficult to speak after the 
very you know uh, uh, evil uh, uh, panel yeah, uh, who has spoken before me and um, before that I, I forgot to mention I would also like to thank you know the uh, 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 Dr. Rodin, the chairman, uh, chairman of the uh, Burmese American community for his uh, generous introduction. You know, the introduction, uh, actually, uh, in, briefly, in short, uh, briefly uh, about uh, my career, I have, been, I have served in the foreign ministry for, for nearly uh, 40, <laughs> 37 years. <laughs> so uh, th uh, that's my I'm career diplomat. Uh, so I have never served uh, except foreign ministry and uh, embassies ab abroad. So um, it is uh, indeed great honor to make a keynote address at this um, US Myanmar conference. On behalf of the government of Myanmar, I would like to thank the, all the organizers uh, of this event. It is very timely and relevant at the time of critical transformation in our country. I also wish to thank all the distinguished guests for their presence today and also for their special interest in our country and our country's relation with the uh, United States. As I said earlier, you know, uh, we had had you know, very interesting uh, panel discussion. Um, I have learned a lot uh, from the panelists. I, uh, although I am serving as the ambassador to the United Nations, uh, it has been uh, over four years I've been away from my country. I only had a chance to get back one time when uh, President Obama visited our country. And also, uh, so uh, I have learned a lot from the panelists who have the uh, vast knowledge about our country, you know, who, have, who are working on, on ground in Nepido. So um, as requested by an organizer, I'm going to present you know, the, our side of view of uh, uh, US-Myanmar relations and also uh, uh, the recent political economic developments in Myanmar, as well as the opportunity and challenges uh, facing Myanmar. So, and if, uh, 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 I also overwhelmed with the diversity of the uh, panelists, as well as diversity of the audience, and also diversity of interest. So, the, but these people has one thing in common. They want special interest in our country. They want to see Myanmar a uh, peaceful, de developed, democratic country. Uh, so, uh, if I, uh, in my presentation, because since uh, I'm speaking in, in front of those people who knows better than me our country, so I think, it, please correct me if I am wrong. So I would like to start with the U.S.-Myanmar relations. Uh, United States is one of the earliest countries we had established diplomatic relations in 1947, which is even before we, rega we regained independence, which is 1948. You know, the as early as 2011, Myanmar was perceived here in the United States as a country very much isolated, governed by a rep repressive military government, locking up all its political opponents. This perception has changed uh, since the, you know, the President U Teng Singh was uh, elected and embarked on the path of democratic transition in 2011. Since then, Myanmar has left behind the uh, military government and embarked, uh, embraced multi-party democratic system. Every aspect of Myanmar is evolving very rapidly in the post positive way, including political, economic, and social landscape. The, many, uh, the ch changes are visible not only in our domestic political la landscape, but also in its relation with the global community. We have reach out to the internal community. Until a little over three years ago, U.S.-Myanmar relations was marked by mistrust, uh, sanctions, trade and investment bans, and a little or no trace of high-level contact. So the, today, the diplomatic relation has been normalized and abrogated at the ambassador level. Most sanctions imposed 
by the EU and US has been eased or suspended. A new consulate general was opened recently, a few days uh, last week, uh, the, in Los Angeles. The President Obama has already visited Myanmar twice in the previous two years. President Utain Singh was in the White House in 2013 on an historic visit and met with President Obama and they have signed a bilateral investment protection and trade promotion agreement. So the, at the also, uh, also at, if we look at the regional international level, Myanmar, uh, Myanmar used to be, uh, we, sometimes they, Myanmar used to be labeled as the problem chime in ASEAN. Now things have changed. So Myanmar has last year successfully chaired ASEAN, uh, ASEAN <coughs> And as well as not only ASEAN, we have also chaired BIMSTEC, which is another regional economic grouping uh, comprising about seven countries in the, uh, surrounding the Bay of Bengal. Uh, Myanmar has even represented ASEAN at the last year's uh, G20 summit in Australia. So it has also hosted World Economic Forum. And so Myanmar has status of political freedom also, and also meet Myanmar's current status of political freedom and media freedom also relatively very much higher than most countries in the region. All these amazing developments are pointing to how Myanmar has come to reintegrate into the global community. So let me now look uh, look at, uh, uh, took a glance in the, to, to, to the warming of United States and Myanmar uh, friend relations. Over the past two decades, U.S. policy towards Myanmar was totally dominated by human rights and democracy issues. There was a visible, visible game change in their foreign policy after President Obama took office in January 2009. The administration reviewed our, uh, its policy on Myanmar and began to change its approach in 2009. I'm telling brief history just for the sake of those who are not very familiar with this uh, <laughs> event. So it coincided at the time when China has become the second largest economy in the world, overtaking Japan in 2010. Against this block, President uh, Obama announced his decision to rebalance American foreign policy towards Asia in late 2011. So the change of US policy approach to Myanmar might also be, uh, this is in our view, a part of its wider strategy towards Asia. Then the Secretary of State Hillary, uh, the, the Secretary of State at the time, the Secretary Hilton, uh, the Hillary Clinton, announced during her tour of Asia in February 2009. Administration's intention to review its policy towards Myanmar as neither, uh, neither Western sanctions nor the ASEAN's constructive engage, engagement seemed working. So that has led to the announcement of uh, President Obama's in September 2009, a dual track foreign policy, also known as calibrated engagement policy. So the, uh, that means they are, going, they are maintaining sanctions while simultaneously engaging the Myanmar government at senior level dialogues. This is before the changes take place in, in Myanmar. You know? On Myanmar's side, it coincided with the time when Myanmar's political roadmap was uh, about to end, culminating in the holding of first democratic multi-party elections in November 2010. Regardless, regardless of uh, different views and criticism on those elections, it was that very general elections which has led to ending the, uh, ending the era of military government and formation of new civilian government and all those amazing changes we are witnessing today. 
Following the exchange of the president's visit between the two countries in 2012 and 2013, bilateral relations was elevated to a, to a new level, you know, the, which has paved the way for the bilateral cooperation and coordination between our two countries. It also paved the way for more frequent exchange of visit at different level between the people, between the government officials, par parliamentarians, and civil and society. So our mission in New York, our Washington, embassy in Washington are getting busier than before. So this was resulted in easing of the most, uh, most of the United States sanctions on Myanmar by waiving restrictions on the provision of financial services, authorizing new investment by American company, and also permitting the imports of all products from Myanmar except jade and rubies. The United States has also rendered full support to Myanmar's multifaceted reform process and development program. As uh, our panelists from US and USAID said, the USAID mission has opened in Yangon in 2012, and also the uh, President Obama made a pledge for about $170 million for assistance over two years in the areas of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law, transparent government, peace and reconciliation, health, economic opportunity, and food security. At the same time, the United States government also helped us in creating favorable conditions and environment in order to increase U.S. business, trade, and investment in Myanmar. One of them was the granting of the general license by the tre Treasury Department, as mentioned by earlier panelists, you know, uh, the, the authorizing four Myanmar banks for transaction with some uh, limitations. The U.S. XM, the Exxon Bank has also began you know, offering credit for trade with Myanmar since February 2014, by which the bank will provide U.S. businessmen with export credit, insurance, loan guarantees, and direct loans for credit while the export sales to Myanmar. There are a growing number of bilateral engagement between Myanmar and the United States, if, if I may mention some of them. The opening of the first commercial service office in Myanmar, and also signing of trade and investment framework agreement, we call TIFA, and also investment incentive agreement, uh, also establishment of Myanmar-US, uh, the uh, human rights dialogue, uh, which has met twice already, and a cooperation in joint POW, MIA, you know, and also the signing of MOU between USA, USAID and Myanmar NPED with the cooperation of National Democratic Institute. Of the offer, the also, there's an offer of US system to upgrade you know, Yango Mendeley Express Highway. Uh, there are so many things uh, that I, I'm just uh, citing. Uh, few. Now, currently, the US, uh, United States also helping us to re for the renovation of the very uh, well-known the Golden Monastery in Mendeley. So, uh, if I may l look at uh, the uh, uh, very re recent development, we are very much regrettable. United States see it fit to continue to uh, the continue the national emergency with respect to Myanmar and extended recently its existing sanctions against Myanmar. However, despite this action, the United States indicated its uh, continued commitment to supporting and strengthening Myanmar reform efforts and to continue working with the Myanmar government to sustain the democratic transition. Despite some remaining human rights challenges, we feel that Sanctions are no longer a rational policy for addressing the challenges as the government of Myanmar is fully committed to move on with the democratization process. We feel that U.S. policy should continue to focus on fully supporting Myanmar's effort for transition to ensure that the sustainability in the run-up to the following elections and beyond. So today, as I said earlier, Myanmar has become a center of world's great interest and attention due to its peaceful transition. 
the expectations are also very high from the international community about futures of Myanmar. So many positive changes are happening in our country due to the, uh, the political and economic reforms. We have re succeeded in making many significant benchmarks in a very short time. The most visible area is the reform of the uh, granting of more freedoms for the press, freedom of assembly and association, the freedom of association. The peaceful transformation to a democratic system. This is also, we have also, yeah, this is one of the achievements. The country has, you know, peacefully shifted from the military government to an all-inclusive democratic political system with a strong and viable, very active uh, parliament, which is listening very carefully, attentively to the voice of the people. We have a bicameral system or assembly with lower house, which is people assembly, upper house, the, there's a nationalities parliament, and combined assembly we call the union parliament, with executive branch and legislative and judicial branch. One of the uh, major achievements was the, as uh, Mr. Hanyo has mentioned uh, <coughs> in detail, the, the reaching of uh, agreement with the uh, 16th armed eth ethnic group on the draft text of nationwide ceasefire agreement, which will bring even more, uh, each, uh, which uh, this agreement will end the more than 60 years of ethnic conflict. This agreement is also historian achievement for the gov government as it will lead to political dialogue on important, you know, the uh, pending issues. Yet, uh, some observer still questions, you know, are the reforms real or are they just superficial to legitimize the, you know, the, the, the current government or are the reforms are backsliding? There are so many questions. The scope and pace of Myanmar's transformation was viewed very differently by different observers due to their different interests. Some say too slow, some say too fast. So, if you compare with the yastic of the U.S. democracy, Myanmar's current status of reform seems to be very, uh, rather slow and sluggish. But if you compare with our own recent past, Myanmar's changes you are seeing today are amazingly fast and seems unbelievable. There has been huge incremental progress uh, towards the democratization and promoting human rights. Well, let's see the uh, brief comparison. Until four years ago, Myanmar was under a military government, now elected civilian government with a viable parliament. Political freedom had to be whispered before, you know. Now it can be enjoined by all. They can speak freely at the tea shop, you know. We have now, we now have the greater media freedom and political freedom than ever before. Until 2012, our, the, the, uh, the uh, MP, Aung San Suu Kyi, was under house arrest. She is now a prominent member of parliament, chairing Law of Law Committee. The, before, the no labor unions were allowed or assembled. Now we have a greater freedom of assembly and association. Political space are widening. The civil societies are granted more space to maneuver. A new political culture of dialogue and discourse was cultivated successfully. Before, many world leaders, business leaders uh, are shunning Myanmar. Today, they are running and rushing to Myanmar. Before, Myanmar is a destination boycotted by Western tourists. Now, it has become one of the most popular destinations in the world. By simply looking at these visible changes, it will be wrong to argue that nothing has changed in Myanmar, or there were signs of backsliding. Myanmar has reached to the point of no return. There will be no turning back. The truth is, Myanmar is struggling on the path to the democratic transition, 
confronting inevitable challenges as the government is making multiple reform in all sectors at the same time, at the lowest, at the time of lowest capacity. You know, it is also facing expected and unexpected challenges. We have already implemented low-hanging fruits like freedom of media, freedom of uh, <coughs> association. Uh, the, uh, the <coughs> but we have already implemented the uh, low-hanging fruit, but higher fruit like amending constitution, you know, or phasing out the role of the military would definitely need time for their materialization. Amending our constitution also is a, not an event, it's a process. You know, we have to do in process stage by stage. So I think we need the understanding of the uh, international community. So, and, and anyway, the, the issue of amending constitution also had been discussed in the parliament, but they are finding difficulty to move ahead. That's why the, the parliament has proposed holding of, a, uh, holding of talks among the six leaders uh, which already met once to thresh out the pending issues. The parliament will consider the issues based on the result of the, what we call the, uh, the talks among the uh, uh, six leaders. So the, these are um, where we are now with regard to constitution. Like many other countries, human rights situation Myanmar is not yet perfect. I agree, uh, uh, I recognize that. It cannot and can never be totally perfect like many other countries. Although there are still human rights challenges, the progress achieved in a short time is amazing compared to the period of the military government's time. So the international attention of Myanmar, uh, the international attention on Myanmar today is unfairly disproportionate, you know. Countries with greater level of human rights abuses did not get more international attention than Myanmar. That is the fact we are facing uh, today. So everywhere you're taking, actually it's so many international countries take a lot of, not concern, they are, they are taking a lot of con contrast. Every move, the government's move, was being watched by the very closely in the international community because of the, you know, their interest in our country. So, lack of capacity is the key challenge at the time of sudden, suddenly opening up of the society. The democratic changes are made from top-down approach with the absence of proper democratic institutions and with the old mindset and, and the habits with time hard. So I think we, when the government make the changes, the people also they need to change us. They, even the government services, they also have the old habit. They, let, they, they lived under, you know, uh, uh, under the, uh, the military government for uh, five decades. Now they also need to adjust with the uh, newfound uh, freedom. So that's why I would like to stress this point. Myanmar needs time to adjust the new policy, new freedoms. We need to help our population to become, to become more aware of their rights and responsibilities. Uh, at this very delicate juncture, immediate withdrawal of the armed forces from the political life of the, the, uh, the multi-ethnic countries could cause serious uh, uh, destabilization. So I think uh, we need to take time to when we talk about you know phasing of the the role of the military as well, so the uh, I now uh, take it about the economic aspect either because this is organized by one university which uh, the, the which also take a lot of interest in uh, bus doing business in our country. The after decades of uh, you know the uh, solitary existence, Myanmar has now it's opened its gate for foreign investment. While the initial reforms focused mainly on political system and national unity, major economic reforms are now well underway. In parallel with the political reform, government has launched waves of economic reforms through economic and financial liberalization. As you may know, of course, the exchange rate has been unified 
under a managed float, and the, the, our country has now an independent central bank. Central bank has been separated from the government. National budget has been become more transparent than before. Unnecessary barriers to business and trade has been removed. Uh, the providing legal foundations for foreign investment, improving the essential public services, infrastructures. Our foreign investment law was also revised. We had even sought OECD's advice. We went under, we got the, the policy review initiative under OECD. So I think uh, the way, the way when we uh, revised the foreign policy, we sought their advice and we also corrected the weakness. Uh, <coughs> so the, uh, because of these uh, economic uh, reform measures, it has resulted in GDP growth, as the panels mentioned, over more than 7% for, uh, for the past years. So a remarkable performance, you know, held by lifting or easing of the uh, decade-long sanctions. FDI is on a flowing, uh, follow, uh, flowing in, foreign exchange earnings also rising, and tourism industry has so booming, reaching two million this year. This is, a, this is a drastic increase from just a little over half a million four years ago. So Myanmar was now, level is as Asia, Asia's last economic frontier. So now, let me say, uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, some of the panelists also mentioned at the point, point uh, we, we should invest in our country. So the, with the international sanctions falling by, by the wayside, the potential of the resource-rich country has never been greater. With over 50 million people, Myanmar is an attractive market and a prime location base with low labor cost. So the, we, there's a, a lot of opportunity for labor intensive manufacturing activities where we're also benefit to the people. The mar market is very appealing as Myanmar is in the prox proximity of the giant market of China, India, ASEAN, whose combined G population now three billion. This is a very huge market, you know. Just last year alone, Myanmar has received you know, eight billion, uh, eight billion dollars of foreign investment, mainly in extractive sectors and mobile communication. Some says lack of infrastructure, like power, internet, uh, telecommunications, or proper banking services are obstacles for alluring foreign investment. This point was also made by uh, the uh, earlier panelists. So to those, I would like to mention about uh, uh, one story. You know, there's, um, there's two, uh, two, two marketing officials from two different shoe companies. They are looking for market in one isolated, uh, uh, isolated country in Africa. So for, uh, at that country, very remote, so remote that the nobodies wear the shoes. So one um, marketing officer reported, oh, the market is zero, nobody wears a shoe. So, uh, but the other marketing officer reported to his company, oh, the, wear, the market is very huge, nobody wears the shoes. So if you can convince them to wear the shoe, it's a huge market. So this, uh, I think, story, I would like to compare with uh, our case. You know, to those who claim that you know, there's lack of infrastructure uh, uh, is an obstacle, we should view the, the lack of infrastructure uh, uh, as an opportunity, not as a challenge. I think if we do not have uh, electricity, go and build power, uh, invest in the, the power generating uh, factory, and also if you do, if you have lack of internet and telecommunications, please go and invest in telecommunication incest. So I think we should transform the challenges into opportunity. This is uh, a piece of advice from me. So uh, the, we do not claim that uh, everything is in rosy pictures. No transition was a smooth, trans smooth sailing, you know. In many parts of the world, we have witness, witnessed many countries, they transform into uh, dictatorship to, you know, de democratic country, and they failed in their transition. But Myanmar has made a peaceful transition. Myanmar's achievement, we feel that underappreciated in behind some international community. 
But challenging times lies ahead in the run up to the 2015 elections. Election brings expectations as well as polarizations in the country. Hope, election also brings bring hope as well as fears. Nearly 80 political parties, consider 80 pol political parties, will be taking part in those elections scheduled to be held in earlier November. The exact date of the election will be announced three, three months before, prior to the election. So all eyes will be glued to Myanmar in the coming months. As the general elections draws near, it is quite natural. The criticism and the bad news, bad stories against the current government will become louder and <laughs> louder. So to belittle the achievement uh, received, made during the government's time. So every, for the election, the, the, the every effort is being made to, uh, for, uh, to become a free and fair election. Election Commission has also already invited observers, foreign observers, including Qatar Center and the Uni European Union. The international community should support, uh, sh <coughs> should support not an individual or an individual political party, rather to support whoever will embark on the ongoing reform process for a peaceful transition to a democratic society. I believed whoever becomes the president, and I am very sure that he will, be, uh, he will become, uh, <coughs> he will proceed and move ahead of the, the current reforms. The government is fully committed to move forward on, the, on this part of the democratic transition with no stream running out. Like other transition countries, Myanmar is confronting with inevitable, inevitable challenges unleashed by the sudden opening of this society. Yet, it has made tremendous progress in many fronts, including the, uh, of course, the, uh, the, 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 strike, uh, the striking of nationwide ceasefire agreement and also preparation for a free and fair election. I think this is also good news for uh, 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 the, our uh, Burmese community who has come from the uh, from Chen State, I think uh, the the reaching agreement, the political dialogue, will also contribute the development of the bring uh, peace and stability. And uh, through peace stability, I think we can also develop. We, earlier, we also talk about uh, stability and development. I think uh, there uh, there are some claim that political stability. Only when political stability uh, exists, I think we can build on uh, the uh, we can built on economic development. I, we also feel uh, the other way that, you know, development also very important. Only when the, we have a development, it will also, if we, uh, it will also contribute to the uh, stability. I think that these are uh, uh, interactive phenomena, I think, yeah. So we hope that uh, from this uh, engagement conference, well, uh, it will pro provide us the opportunity to assess the situation objectively and chart out the policy option to continue to support Myanmar government for the success of the, its ongoing reform. We feel that continued retention and extending of the remaining uh, unilateral sanction from the United States side will not only be like, uh, it will be like uh, imposing sanctions against its own business community because some other businessmen from the rest of the world uh, are now rushing to Myanmar. So I think the, you, the U.S. business community should not wait until Myanmar's reform process is complete. All human rights conditions are perfect. So is the military to military engagement. Engage first and the improvement were on human rights would follow, not the other way around. Now some people are waiting for the improvement of human rights, you know. Uh, so I think we got to explain to the <laughs> uh, to, to, to the uh, policymaker in the uh, uh, in the Congress. So I think engage first, and the improvement in human rights will follow, not the other way around. I just like to repeat that: helping Myanmar first for its development through trade and investment will help us to deliver quick benefit to the people. Our reform process will succeed only 
when we can deliver benefit and the <coughs> benefit for the people, for all the people uh, uh, throughout the countries. So I think if you, uh, through the uh, trade investment, if you can help the people to deliver the, uh, uh, to get the benefit, it will in turn contribute not only expand the United States influence in the country, in the region as well. It will also contribute to the success of the ongoing peaceful democratic transition, transition, which is the common goal of Myanmar and the United States. United States policies need to involve engagement on its core element, we call, they call it the 3D, diplomacy and development, also defense. So I think, <coughs> So I wish to conclude uh, you know, with this message you know, that despite formidable challenges, uh, the com commitment of the leaders of Myanmar remained strong. Myanmar's effort to reform needs continued understanding of our challenges and complexities, as well as encouragement and assistance from the United States for the success of the, our transition. For its national uh, uh, interest in our interest, the United States should follow the option uh, uh, of uh, engagement and support to our country. Before I also conclude, I also, uh, I, I also uh, uh, would like to mention how pleased I am to meet with the Myanmar community. I was um, uh, uh, surprised to learn that over, over, uh, over uh, the 12,000 uh, uh, nationality and so many Myanmar and Korean community are living here. Whatever the, the reason they have le left the country, they still have uh, the interest, they also have the uh, goodwill uh, to see the, you know, uh, to see uh, the development, and peace, uh, peaceful development of our country. And they also would like to see a better future of they are native countries. So I think uh, uh, the, the, uh, we, uh, the, no, right now, the, the country has changed. The condition at the time of the left ha is not there. So I think uh, we, uh, President Ute Singh has also invited, you know, the uh, diasporas, you know, to, to help us in every way for the development of our country. I also, yeah, I think uh, the, uh, with the experience, expertise, and also uh, the, their wealth gained here in the United States will also, uh, uh, can also be used to, 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 to contribute to our development efforts for the people of Myanmar in terms of education, also uh, economic development. Yeah, I think through their Taking this advantages living abroad, they can take uh, use the networking of their country and join us in our effort to help the people of Myanmar to uh, to bring uh, to uh, uh, <coughs> to uh, to become uh, uh, a peaceful and stable and a democratic country in our country. So, with that note, I would like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, His Excellency U Cho Din, for your valuable keynote speech. I want to add that uh, not only 12,000 chins, we have uh, about 2,000 Karen, Kareni, Kachin, Shan, all the ethnic group in Indianapolis alone. Uh, let me add uh, 14,000 Burmese community here with uh, 7,000 Burmese community in Fort Wayne, the second largest city of Indiana. We are about nearly 23,000, 24,000 Burmese community here. Um, now, we are going to have lunch, and the lunch will be served as like a buffet style in the lobby. We can have our lunch in a, the, the table in, in, inside this conference. And I would like to announce that the conference will resume at uh, 1 p.m. here. Thank you very much. <laughs>